This is a, a, a fireside chat between uh, Mr. Uday Shankar, who is the president of FIKI, and the Right Honorable Baroness Parashar, chairperson of FIKI UK Council. Uh, this event is part of a series of monthly fireside chats aimed at engaging with experts to get insights on various issues and learning, learning from their experiences. Uh, these sessions also dwell upon opportunities for innovation, collaboration, and reform in the sector. We have had successful sessions on important topics like growing and funding your business through a pandemic, higher education and reform plans in India. And we have a very exciting one uh, here today. Uh, and we all, I'm sure, are excited to hear the views uh, of uh, Mr. Uday Shankar on the fusion of creative and digital uh, you know, economy. Uh, FIKI, as, we, uh, as I'm sure all of you know, was established in 1927 on the advice of Mahatma Gandhi. Uh, FIKI is the largest and the oldest uh, apex business organization in India. While addressing the fourth AGM of FIKI, Mahatma Gandhi had said, the industry should regard themselves as trustee and servant of the poor. Gandhiji's faith reflects in every existence uh, of FIKI, as well as our activities that we do. Let me now introduce uh, our speaker for the day, Mr. Uday Shankar, who is a stalwart from the media and entertainment industry with over three decades of experience in the sector. Until recently, he was the president Asia Pacific of the Walt Disney Company and the chairman of Star and Disney India. He is the president of the Federation of Indian Chambers of Commerce and Industry, FIKI, and he is the first media and entertainment executive to lead a business chamber in India. He led charge of Disney's transformation into a direct-to-consumer company in most exciting region of the world. Prior to his role at Disney, he was the president of 21st Century Fox for Asia and chairman and CEO of Star India. He took over the leadership of Star in India in 2007 and since then transformed Star into one of the largest and the most successful media companies in Asia. In addition to his leadership, uh, of Star and Disney, Mr. Uday Shankar has played a key role in shaping the media and entertainment industry in India. He has been at the forefront of landmark reforms for the industry and, is, uh, and its consumers, including self-regulation and digitalization of television distribution ecosystem. He has earlier been the president of the Indian Broadcasting Foundation, IBF, and the chairman of FIKI's Media and Entertainment Committee. With this background, I would also like to introduce uh, the Right Honorable Baroness Parashar, chairperson of the FIKI UK Council. This series of fireside chats is a result of her vision to enhance FIKI's role as industry's voice for policy reforms. Under her dynamic leadership, FIKI's UK Council has been expanding rapidly and now en is engaging with businesses across the sectors and regions in the UK. Baroness Parashar has also been the Deputy Chair of British Council in India. Ladies and gentlemen, she, uh, uh, we shall take a few questions um, for uh, our speakers towards the end of the session. May I request you to please ask your questions in the Q&A box of your screen. I'm sure, uh, like me, our participants are also excited uh, for this fireside chat. May I now request uh, Baroness Parashar and Mr. Uday Shankar to carry on the chat. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Param, for those uh, introductions. And a very warm welcome, uh, uh, Uday, if, if, if I may. And as I said, you are, we are delighted to have you. You've had a very glittering career in, in this field. So we are very much looking forward to your insights into, into the whole area of uh, creative industries and, and so on. Um, now, to start with, in the recent years, we've seen digital technologies converging with creative industries. So from your point of view, what are the major trends that are emerging for the sector resulting from this convergence? First of all, uh, Param, very, you know, thank you very much for having me here. I'm delighted to be with all of you and Baroness Parashar. Thank you for uh, this conversation. I really appreciate this. Uh, now to come to your question, ma'am, uh, I think, uh, you know, this trend, I'd like to just uh, make one point right at the outset, is that uh, 
technology has always played a role in uh, in creating the business of media and by that i mean that basically by creating by taking content to the people you know uh, the trend that we are seeing of mm -hmm. digital technologies of course is a new one uh, or a recent one but uh, traditionally people were people created stories they had information and they weren't they wanted to share and as as society and science advance people use that information uh, use that advancement in science to take their messages more clearly and uh, more effortlessly to a larger segment of people first through newspapers then radio and then television then satellite distribution and now technology now digital technologies so it's a it's a it's a gradual evolutionary process that we've all lived with and i think where we are today is is a really exciting time for the business of media because uh, you know the, when you are when you are creating content the most important uh, aspiration that every creative person has is to seek a wider ever wider audience exactly and how do you take it to them and mm -hmm. today the digital technologies have opened a completely unprecedented opportunity for people to do that uh, a young young kid sitting at home can create a streaming service and create content using a mobile phone which can be short short form or long form which could be refreshed frequently or which could be for a longer shelf life and offer it literally to almost anyone on the planet and hence the opportunity that we see is that the cost of creating or the effort or the difficulty level of creating content and distributing it is has gone down considerably and the power of uh, compelling content and its reach can has potentially gone up dramatically now mm -hmm. the problem with that is that you know and it's a, it's a hugely liberating democratizing force exactly. but the problem exactly. of that is that uh, it also creates congestion or clutter at times and how do you you know the challenge is how mm -hmm. do how do the content creators stand out in this cluttered environment but uh, overall it's an unprecedented opportunity people can just go and uh, mm. and uh, discover their audience and actually target specifically to you know so far the business was a broadcast you you publish something or you create some content you distribute and you broadcast it to a large number of people and then uh, you know push them through marketing individual targeting was very difficult now individual targeting has become possible and what's even more exciting is that uh, monetization or uh, ha has become far more seamless so direct to consumer uh, access mm -hmm. has also mm -hmm. brought direct uh, monetization opportunity from that specific consumer mm -hmm. so it's a great time all in all absolutely you very comprehensively i think laid out you know the, the opportunities the possibilities and the expansion just moving on to your role at Fiki. Now, Fiki has been a flag bearer for creative industries in India. And you now are at the helm of Fiki. And could you share the work of Fiki in this sector and your vision as president of Fiki, as you know, what you really want to do in this area? So I think Fiki has always been very active and I have had the opportunity to be associated with Fiki and through Fiki Media and Entertainment Committee for almost 15 years now. And uh, during this time, I think Fiki has in many ways, uh, I played a small part in that and Fiki has played a, a ma massive role in, uh, in shaping the whole business of media and entertainment. And its growth as a sector has been extremely, extremely exciting the rate of growth of media and entertainment as a sector year on year has been ahead of most other sectors in this country and this is you know this is one of the sectors that has grown without any official support and despite having a lot of a uh, lot of uh, you know sort of restrictions that come when you're in the business of media content and uh, you know just to give you an example First of all, Fiki created this forum of media and entertainment where uh, mm -hmm. media professionals, entrepreneurs, owners, and executives of all hues could come together mm -hmm. and uh, 
you know, uh, and exchange their ideas, share their views, and 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 uh, exchange notes on problems and and pro and uh, opportunities. And just to give you a few examples, I think mm -hmm. uh, the, as far as television distribution is concerned, the Indian uh, cable and satellite distribution, Indian distribution sector for TV was always uh, a laggard for a long time. Mm -hmm. The world had gone to consolidation of cable, and it's uh, it's uh, a sort of modern, a modern digital cable system. And India was still struggling with uh, sort of not so high quality, not very high on consumer experience, mm -hmm. analog cable system. It mm -hmm. was a challenge for business on both sides, the distributors as well as the content providers. And it was also a, a, a sort of a poor consumer experience. And I think Fiki played a very key role uh, in, in digitalization of cable and i think uh, finally thanks to the efforts of of fiki and in fact uh, uh fiki media and entertainment committee india embarked on a plan of uh, very rapid digitalization of cable and ended up transforming the entire more than 100 million cable homes in a record time so from that kind of initiative then uh, the whole uh, rating system that was, you know, had become a source of concern for industry, society, as well as uh, uh, concerned citizens. And uh, in fact, the then Secretary General of FIKI, Amit Mitra, set up, uh, headed a committee set up by the government to look at the entire ratings mm -hmm. universe. And mm -hmm. based on its um, Amit Mitra committee recommendation, the modern mm -hmm. uh, rating system was devised. So FIKI has always played a very key role in, in sectors like audiovisual, gaming, uh, uh, and animation, digital uh, distribution, all mm -hmm. of these areas. It has been a platform and it has, it has set the agenda for the industry and government to come together and create a progressive framework. Very good. I mean, that's really, and as you probably have told you that in the UK, we've actually, one of our sector committees is on creative industries because it's an area I'm personally very passionate about, so I'm, I'm delighted that we are kind of taking it forward. Um, just moving on to some of the changes you've already indicated, because you know they've been very fast, and the, and the digital economy is shaking up creative industries, and that of course pre presents very new opportunities. And so, opportunity to advance development and diversity. So, what are your thoughts on these new developments? So I think um, there has never been a better time for Indian media and entertainment sector as far as access to market is concerned. In, in, there has never been a dearth of great stories in India, you know, given our, the richness of our civilization, diversity of our culture, and, uh, you know, uh, our passion for telling good stories. I think uh, there, there is a great opportunity there. Uh, the problem is that we have, uh, you know, uh, as far as the government and the policy establishment is concerned, that we tend to look at media and entertainment as a propaganda and influence and entertainment sector rather, rather as a sector of creative economy. And uh, that is an important switch that needs to be made. And if we could make that switch where uh, we treat uh, media and entertainment as a, not just as a pastime, but an important uh, Mm. important creative enterprise, which yeah. can create value for society, uh, both in terms of social value and economic value by providing jobs, creating wealth, and above everything else, taking brand India uh, globally. You know, I, I like to say that some of the Western countries, including the United States, the brand of the country has been built massively on the, on the back of the creative mm. product that has come out of those countries. Mm -hmm. You know, I, mm -hmm. I think uh, nothing has uh, sort of globalized the American way of life and thinking more than the Hollywood. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of opportunity sits with us, you know, given, given the st innate strengths that we have uh, mm -hmm. with, with, with the right, right policy alignment. Uh, in, in Indian uh, industry is, is at a point where it can create a global, global business model. And, uh, and and create enormous value. What do you think Fiki can do to sort of create that different mindset? Because in terms of looking at creative industries, you know, both economically and social, 
So I think sure. it works at two levels. And here mm -hmm. I would like to be a little frank and maybe make some, make a slightly controversial statement. I think the problem lies both on the side of the industry as well as as well mm -hmm. as the government. Uh, government, as I said, needs to make a switch from looking at the industry as as entertainment, pastime, fun, etc., or, or propaganda, to a creative economy which can create value for ordinary citizens. I mean, you know, it's a delightful sector where you don't mm -hmm. need to to have formal degrees like engineering, medicine, MBA, etc. Yeah. If you're creative, which I believe mm -hmm. a lot of people are, if you have a story to tell, or, you know, or if you have, if you can participate somehow in the entire content creation and distribution process, you can, uh, you can, you know, there, there's a career waiting for you, whether it is writing, acting, etc. Yeah. To, to just the business of it. So I think that we need a we need a policy that that is an enabling policy that is in sync with the global trends and that that seeks to position the opportunity and channelize it in the right direction. On the side of the industry, I think, and that part is a bit controversial. I think the industry also needs to move from its uh, uh, mindset of uh, just you know uh, working at the at a small level to look at the whole world. You know, when, when you come out of big big countries and when you have domestically big markets, you can generally get very satisfied with catering to your own domestic needs and not have the larger ambition uh, in the front and center of your uh, agenda. And I think we need to do that. And the industry in India has been, uh, if I can say, it, it has been somewhat guilty of uh, not having a large enough vision or an ambition. We want, to, yes. we want to make a film. As long as the film is successful in our own domestic market, we are very happy. Mm. If it goes to the diaspora and people like you sitting outside of India, watch that movie, we are thrilled. However, we do not, you know, we, we haven't been, you know, one or two exceptions apart. Uh, we, we haven't been very focused on creating a global market for, mm. our, uh, for our media product. And uh, for that, we need to one come to you know come to a shared understanding. We need to look beyond the immediate goals and come to a shared understanding and look at the long-term strategic vision, and then join our hands, go to the government, and make sure that you know we government and the industry both are aligned. I think Fiki can play a huge role in that. Huge role in that, yes. Well, I, I very much hope we can because I think it's 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 something which really needs to happen both both for for UK and 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 for India. Right. Can I just move on to the question of artificial intelligence um, because it is changing the value chains for creative content, and on on the other hand, machine learning has begun to create original content content. And other technologies have the potential to disrupt the value chain. So, how do you see these emerging technologies impacting on creative economy? Look, I think uh, it's already playing a huge role. I think some of the global media and content companies that are operating in the country have already demonstrated the power of machine learning, the power of engineering, power of uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, although it's still in, in early stages in this country, and I think the domestic companies need to need to uh, get us, you know, get 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 uh, get ahead of the trends and take mm -hmm. charge of uh, the direction in which the industry globally is going. So I think there is an important there there is a urgent need to create uh, smart platforms which. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, which understand, you know, while respecting all the social and legal norms and while respecting the privacy of the consumer, we also mm. need to make ourselves better informed, more alert about mm. the, the individual consumer preferences. Yeah. And make sure that we are able to create content for that. Because, what, you know, the technologies that you referred to, they are, you know, they have already impacted uh, for instance, the business of advertising in a very, very fundamental way. And mm -hmm. that's why traditional media companies have, uh, have struggled to, to stay, stay in their game as far mm -hmm. as advertising is concerned. And, and some of these global companies driven by their engineering capabilities mm -hmm. uh, 
have taken away a large part of uh, that. I think the next phase is content creation, where a lot of smart learnings are being deployed. And we need to, we need to become aware of that. And we need to start using that. This whole thing of creativity, you know, of course, it's a creative business, and you need to have a creative gene in your in your in your body to be able to compete. But a lot of this is increasingly being proven is logic, machine learning, and science, and uh, we're still not there at all. And I think mm -hmm. uh, the industry needs to to start. Uh, benchmarking itself with global capabilities and global mm -hmm. inputs. Mm -hmm. and I, I think uh, there's, a, there's a lot of ground to be covered there because if we don't mm -hmm. do that, uh, we, will, we would struggle and, and the opportunity to create a huge global market mm -hmm. or participate in a huge global supply chain would be lost. Yeah. Now that brings me to the whole question about you know capabilities. You know, the area where I think when there's a disruption is always a skills lag behind. What do you think of the skills gap and what are the kind of skills one should be focusing on? Because you know, one of the areas that Fiki does look at is the whole issue of the skills needed in I new industries. Skills, uh, that's a great question you asked. And uh, I think uh, the irony here in this country is that because our growth history is so recent, not just for media, but for almost right. every sector, but especially for, for a modern sector like media. Uh, our, our growth history is so recent that we haven't created formal platforms or institutions to create, you know, to train and deliver or impart skills right. to, right. To, our, to our aspiring professionals. So just to give you an example, you know, the Film and Television Institute that the government of India set up soon after independence, uh, uh, you know, was designed to cater to a very small film industry. Television did mm. not even exist when the FTI was set up. Mm. And, you know, it, it existed in a very small way within the government, mm. private sector mm. television, which is the mm. bulk of TV now, yeah, uh, did not exist. And, uh, uh, you know, we haven't built on those, you know, uh, those small, narrow foundations and enabled a very structured, enabled a very thoughtful and contemporary uh, skills environment, both to, to appreciate what kind of skills we'll need, not just today, but going forward. And mm -hmm. how, do we, how do we make sure that our, our, our workforce has access to those skills, uh, you know, mm -hmm. centers of skills at scale, and our industry is seamlessly plugged into those centers of skills you know, I mean, those centers that deliver those skills. So as a result of that bulk of the development that we are doing, you know, I mean, just imagine mm -hmm. the amount of the volume of content that television and digital services are creating today. Mm -hmm. And uh, there, is, there is really hardly any high quality modern skill center that has come up to train people either on the, on the technical side of it or on the creative side of it. Okay, so a bunch of, sure. bunch of shops have come up. Some of them are doing decent job, but not, you know, almost nothing, if I could be blunt, mm. is ready to compete in the new world. You talked about mm. the engineering and machine skills. Mm. Mm. Uh, again, there is very little dedicated focus on creating skills that are specifically designed, okay, designed. to prepare our workforce and industry mm. Uh, mm -hmm. and to cater to our industry's needs. So I think the whole whole field of media uh, related skills needs to be looked at from a fresh lens. And we need to just completely re-foundation the whole structure of mm -hmm. media related skills and start building on that. I think this is a task where the industry can play a huge role. The oh, yes. needs to understand that, you know, for the user industry within media and entertainment to grow, the skills industry, you know, needs to focus on media and entertainment. Because mm -hmm. unless we have best in class globally competitive skills, we won't have best in class globally competitive media industry. Mm -hmm. Do you think this is something that we can take a lead on in terms of starting conversations with uh, educational institutions? Is that is that an area that you think we should focus on? I absolutely think so. The mm -hmm. you know industry, uh, Fiki can play a critical role in working with the government and uh, industry, 
as well as educational institutions. Because, you know, if I can make a point, I think when it comes mm -hmm. to skills, our, our educational institutions need to uh, retune their curriculum and their focus exactly. on, mm -hmm. you know, very sharply in some of these, uh, you know, to, to, to cater to the needs in some of these areas. Because it's, it's an ironical situation where there, there is a shortage of skills and yet mm. there is a shortage of, uh, you know, shortage of uh, skills that we can make available to our uh, potential uh, workforce, you know, mm. our youngsters. So youngsters are in search of new skills that makes them economically more productive, more employable. Great. And employers Great. are, you know, are in short supply, are, are facing a shortage of uh, those skills. Mm. If mm. we can do the matching, I think we can unlock a very powerful force. And I think Fiki can play a huge role in that. I mean, related to the question of skills, of course, is one of in, you know, in inclusiveness, because in a way, it's an area where I suppose it doesn't attract a large number of females when it comes to sort of creative industries and, 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 and digital area. How do you think we can make them more inclusive and diverse? So, look, I think uh, I agree with you. There is, um, it, we do, uh, the uh, female participation in our workforce in general in any sector is low, but, um, and, and needs to, we need to make very conscious efforts to address that balance because it just enriches us. We don't, this is not a duty. This is not a social responsibility. This is also smart economic strategy, smart mm. business strategy, mm. because your mm. access to workforce quality talent mm. just goes up. However, that said, uh, Sectors of media, especially things like television and, and digital creativity, are areas where, as a, as a rule, I, I think uh, the participation of women is somewhat better than in other sectors, many other sectors. Mm. Mm. But we need to work on that. We need to have a plan. We need to have workforce. And that is where formal skills training becomes important because it important. does two things. One, it imparts mm -hmm. those skills, but it also creates a marketplace for potential employers to come and source those uh -huh. skills. Mm -hmm. And in the absence of that, it just remains scattered uh, and sporadic. Mm. Yeah, very good. Can I then just move on to a, much, a sort of broader area? Because I now want to move on to UK-India relations in this field. But before going there, I mean, from your point of view, is Creative India rising? And what do you think India's role is in this new fusion of creative and digital economy? Let's start there first. Well, I think Creative India is rising. I, I, I see uh, an ambition among Indian uh, creative community and you know and and entrepreneurs who are working in the area of, uh, of mm. creativity and technology to to look at to look beyond India. That's a trend for the first time. So you know. Indian mm. films have started to travel uh, better overseas. Mm. There are a bunch of uh, Indian uh, directors and writers who are consciously looking at tapping into the global markets. I think our production and uh, mm. and uh, you know technology inputs that we are we are or graphic or vi visual effects inputs that we are bringing mm. into our content mm. is is more. Mm. Uh, is coming closer to global standards, not quite there yet, but it's coming. Mm. So I think there are all those things that are happening. And uh, so aspiration wise, we are getting there. It's still early mm. days and, and, and we need to be a lot more structured and focused mm. uh, and strategic. And we need to look at this as an investment, both, you know, from the side of the government and from the side of the industry, mm. we need to look at uh, mm. undertaking a journey rather than hoping or, or, or trying to look for that silver bullet, which, which would immediately and overnight make us globally mm. successful and competitive. Yeah, yeah. I mean, creative industries in the UK have been quite hit, hit have been hit hard, you know, post Brexit, uh, because in fact, I've been involved in some work with the European Union Select Committee in the House of Lords, and we just done a report, which highlights you know, the issues faced by the creative industries in the UK. But of course, on the other side of the coin, people say, you know, we are wanting to be a global Britain and therefore there are vital opportunities. And obviously there's a great deal of focus on UK-India relations. And so what do you see the role of creative industries with UK-India relations into the working together? Where do you think the potential is, where the challenges are? 
I think UK India relationships, uh, are, you know, are, have traditionally been strong. We have a shared history, mm-hmm. and uh, the relationship is strong. And but there is a lot of opportunity to make that, you know, much stronger and far more beneficial to the people of the two two great mm-hmm. countries. And uh, the the creative sector, the creative businesses, can play a huge role because you know we we are bound by. A shared understanding of uh, you know I mean the the uh, easy access to to a common language through English is a uh, huge asset. I think uh, you know again in terms of technology, the fact that uh, we we have high quality uh, technology skills in both the countries, I think together the two countries can can work come up with a with a joint paradigm to create content that is, you know, or businesses that are globally competitive. So I think there is an opportunity to put our heads together in these two countries and see if we can, you know, if, if we can leverage our, our uh, respective strengths and put them together to, to create uh, a globally uh, sort of winning paradigm. And I think there is a lot of opportunity to do that because there's more familiarity, trust, and, uh, and sort of shared understanding between the two countries than probably in any other two countries which are culturally mm-hmm. so different. Mm-hmm. Just building on that, uh, uh, I mean, UK India signed a film co production agreement about a decade ago. Uh, between then and now, there have been significant changes in the evolution of film production, as well as emergence of technologies we've talked about. Do you think you see a need to revisit that treaty and to make it more comprehensive and kind of you know future future proof? I think uh, you know while a lot many of the elements of that treaty are still very relevant, and I don't think we have uh, you know juiced out the entire possibility within that treaty. But I think given how rapidly the world is changing because of technology mm. and. Uh, mm. and you know some of the crises that you talked about. I think there is a need to, uh, you know, uh, go back to the treaty and see how we can, you know, bring it more in tune with uh, with with the realities and the challenges and opportunities that exist in 2021, rather than mm. just even a few years ago. Mm. Well, as you know, that our prime minister is visiting India at the end of April. I very much hope that you put creative industries or high on his agenda. It is something that you you will raise through Fiki, you know, with him because I do I think would, there's a real potential. I would really very much like to do that, and I would think that Fiki, you know it should be one of the important objectives for Fiki to get out of mm. this visit. Mm. I think we, we've covered quite a lot of ground uh, there. Is there anything that I haven't asked you that you'd like to say, or shall we move on to the questions? You know, no, I think about... you'd be, you, you, know, you were very prepared and you've asked a range of questions and thank you for that. Maybe we should open the floor to, to, to our audience. Okay, so Param, I'm gonna hand over to you to manage the question answer session. Sure, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am. Um, there are quite a few questions that have come from members and participants uh, here. Of course, one of them was on possible areas of collaboration between UK and India, which uh, you already answered. Uh, there's a question, uh, you know, from one of our members: is with the advent of the OTT players in India and growing uh, significantly, how do you see the Indian television uh, channels holding up uh, to the competition, and how do they, uh, how can they uh, look uh, to reinvent themselves? Look, there is, I think uh, there are multiple, there are two or three dimensions to this question. First and foremost, the simple answer is that Indian television business still has a lot of headroom for growth. Because uh, if you see television is a highly aspirational uh, aspirational product and um, as Indian homes get uh, more affluent, get more alert and get more plugged into the to the society, there is a natural desire to acquire a television set. So very simply, I think uh, we have about 125 to 150 million TV homes today as incomes grow. Uh, most of these homes are still single TV homes. As incomes grow, a lot of homes would acquire more than one TV. 
and a lot of homes that don't have a TV set will con will will get uh, a TV set. So I think both the, the television industry as a rule should continue to grow. The question is how much we will be able to engage uh, uh, the attention of our audiences, and that's entirely up to the industry. How much experiment, how 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 alert and experimental and innovative we are going to be in terms of uh, telling better stories, fresher stories, and uh, delivering a very high quality consumer experience. I think there is a big shift that has happened in the world on account of digital media is that the consumer experience, not just in terms of the story experience, the, you know, the quality of story and acting and, and faces, et cetera, but also the entire, uh, the way the consumer interacts with the screen has become very much become part of the experience. How seamless it is, how easy it is. Do can I watch it when I want to watch it? Can I watch it the manner in which I want to watch it? All of those things. So technological technology has become very much a part of the product experience, and we need to move from the story experience to a holistic consumer experience uh, or a product experience. And that unless we, you know, I mean, I see that to be the biggest challenge because I still think that for a variety of reasons, some uh, inside the industry and some outside the industry, but for a variety of reasons, we are not at yet as innovative and as, uh, as sort of uh, creative and experimental in, in engaging with our audiences and, and viewers mm -hmm. as we can be. So I think if we, you know, in general, I think television will continue to grow and should continue to grow but the real challenge to TV comes not from digital technologies, but from its own, uh, you know, sort of agility to grow and innovate. Thank you so much. Um, on the point of UK India collaboration, um, and and there's a question around it that how do you see the Indian animation and gaming sector growing and the potential for a possible collaboration with the UK? I think that, you know, I think the, given our strength in technology, the animation sector is already doing very well and it can be, India can become the global uh, sort of platform for, uh, you know, for uh, cutting edge animation and uh, vi visual effects and, and all the tech driven creative uh, inputs that global media and entertainment businesses require. I do know of a few companies, uh, companies like Double Negative, et cetera, that are that work out that are based in the US, in the UK, but have Indian participation in them. So I think the two countries can work really very well together in terms of uh, developing the animation and, and, and gaming businesses. In gaming, India, after remaining sort of sluggish or slow to start. For a number of years, has now suddenly that that uh, that whole ecosystem has warmed up dramatically, and companies like Dream Eleven and many of the other companies, you know, different flavors of of gaming, but broadly within the umbrella of gaming-based entertainment, uh, I think they are doing really well. And these are these companies, some of them have become world class, and and many of them have the potential to become world class companies. And uh, India and UK can work both in terms of product development and technology inputs, but also to to partner to to partner to win the global markets. Thank you. Um, in in terms of uh, regional players uh, in India, uh, what is, what are your views on the potential for regional players uh, in India? Uh, in a true globalized uh, digital entertainment industry? Um, and is there potential for a private institute, film institute, uh, to be successful in the present scenario? So first of all, Param, with due respect, I don't like the term regional industry. I mean, th we have given this uh, nomenclature and I think it's, uh, it's sort of discriminatory and we should uh, move away from this. There's no reason to believe that Hindi or English is national and the rest of it is regional. These are, you know, they're today, uh, they're just about as thriving markets as any. And I think in many areas, you know, 
other languages, whether it is Tamil, Telugu, Malayalam, both in terms of their creativity, the input in you know of technology, creating high quality consumer experience. They are head to head. In many cases, they are way ahead of where the so-called national uh, businesses are. So that said, I think uh, they can all become, the, the linguistic barriers are, are falling apart and are rapidly becoming irrelevant. If, uh, if small countries from the world like Korea or from Turkey can create content and, you know, or Israel can create content that are traveling globally and not just traveling, but succeeding and competing against the dominant, uh, dominant uh, content globally and winning. I don't see why content from either Hindi language or other Indian languages cannot be globally competitive and, and win. So it's about, again, resetting our ambitions and making sure that we do all the right things to win, to, to create content and create content brands in a clutter. I, I started by saying that the world is becoming a little bit cluttered. And in a cluttered world, brand is, is a very, very important, uh, important uh, sort of filter or strength. And I think it's important for us to work on creating superior content, but also creating superior content brands. And once we do that from all parts of the country, I think we can compete and win globally. Um, on, the, on the point of uh, startups, India has seen a surge uh, in startups and especially in the creative sector as well. Um, there's an interesting question and I'm sure a lot of us would want to know, when do you see uh, Indian creative uh, tech company becoming a global unicorn? A unicorn is a unicorn because to these days there are there is no such thing as an Indian unicorn because in, the investment in these companies is coming from global investors. You know uh, whether it is global angel investors, venture investors, or other other private equity, etc. So they make they they're investing primarily because they see power in these companies. So I think a lot of uh, unicorns are already there, and I think that number is only going to grow. Uh, whether it is in the area, the the real question is, can we can we widen our uh, you know, the field of our ambition and take it beyond India. And the, there are some companies, I do know that uh, a, a, a bunch of young, very smart, very visionary, very audacious uh, entrepreneurs who are working in the area of tech and creativity, they are already very focused on, on not just being satisfied with winning in India or creating value in India, but going global. And I think it's... Uh, it's only a matter of time before we see a lot of our uh, a lot of such companies popping up on the global scene and and, and making a mark for themselves. Uh, we have with us uh, Dr. Richard Wilhelm, who is uh, you know the founder of Rich Learning. Um, he's of course moving a bit uh, towards the skills and development side. Um, he says that how can Brand India position itself uh, to lead in edtech, especially uh, amongst the littlest of the little and the poorest of the poor? So I, I, I think uh, actually ed education and, and ed tech is, is, is one area where I think Indian um, enterprise and tech, tech enterprise has really done, done very well, whether it is in terms of uh, uh, you know, learning test in, in segments like test prep, kids education, uh, uh, areas like professional and, and ongoing professional development in all these areas, there are some really, really powerful initiatives that are going on. And I think any of these companies can go on to become globally uh, successful. They, are, they, they have created a hugely uh, impressive foundations in India. The real issue in, in areas like education is to make sure that we allow, uh, we, we create sort of uh, strong boundary conditions, but within that we allow enterprise and creativity to have a free play. And I think our regulatory, you know, our regulatory structure and our regulatory mindset needs to be, you know, needs to be revisited uh, and retune to current current requirements very deeply. 
So, you know, the formal education in this country, and I, I have to say at the beginning that the new education policy that governments and government announced last year is a hugely progressive, uh, progressive document. It had, there are, you know, uh, there are things that can get better, but I think after, after many decades, three or four decades, three decades, at least we have, we've got a document that is, uh, that looks really promising and that has a very fresh perspective on the subject of education. But that said, I think it's the document still stops short of, uh, of, you know, being completely radical in terms of allowing participation from, uh, you know, in informal education, whether it is at the lowest of the lowest level, whether it is for, for affluent people or whether it is for uh, marginalized segments. I think there is, a, there is an opportunity and there is a need to harness private enterprise, private capital. And for that, we need to create a level transparent, um, you know, playing field. That, you know, that, that, if that were to happen, I think uh, education um, uh, can, can the, the whole paradigm of education can change. The other thing that we have to recognize is the investment. You know, the investment in education needs to grow by an order of magnitude. We spend, given the scale of challenge, or even on an absolute scale, we spend much less on countries that we are trying to benchmark ourselves against, whether it is China, whether it is Western Europe, whether it is the US. And uh, we also have this, you know, shortage of the, the, the legacy of shortage that we have, we have to deal with. And in order to uh, sort of overcome all that and, and, and get to a globally competitive level, we need massive investments and we need to we need to stop being shy and stop couching education under the whole cloak of oh it's just charity if high quality for profit capital is available to deploy and create good outcomes i think we need to create a framework which allows that and that's the only way we can solve the problem of education yeah yeah on the on the point of education and skill development, um, and with the uh, provision in the new education policy for uh, foreign universities also to set up campuses in India, um, do you see uh, uh, you know what role rather do you see for UK to play in the skills development initiative in India in various sectors? Look, UK has a glorious educational tradition, you know, across the board from school education to university to higher education, research, etc. And uh, again, the new education policy talks about letting foreign uh, universities or educational institutions come to India. And I think that's a huge opportunity, opportunity for the two countries to partner and bring great educational brands uh, great educational experiences and great educators and their uh, and and their accumulated wisdom and experience to this country, and use that with our own ability to to you know take a traditional paradigm and and just sort of disrupt it using the power of technology. So, mm -hmm. how do we bring the you know the entire uh, sort of uh, body of knowledge that exists in in you know body of knowledge in, in education that exists in, in the UK and bring it and make sure that we create affordable access, you know, access for a large uh, part of our population. I think it requires a mindset change at the government levels in the two countries. It also requires a mindset change. We cannot, we tend to be, you know, uh, it, when it comes to brands of in areas like education, those who, have, who are responsible for those brands or custodians of that brand, Rightly so, most of the time, but sometimes, uh, sometimes excessively become excessively possessive and almost protective about it. I think uh, that comes in the way of exploring uh, new opportunities. So, if you have to take a high quality brand from the United Kingdom and bring it to India, you cannot bring it within the same same architecture. You need to take the essence of it, the idea behind it, and create a new architecture which is relevant and uh, sort of uh, uh, sort of successful and deployable at scale in 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 the in, in the Indian context. And I think uh, that is where we need to be open. We need to be collaborative, 
And I think there is a great opportunity for the two countries to create value. Thank you. Thank you so much on, on, on that uh, note as well. Um, I, I am aware of uh, the fact that we are running uh, towards the end of the uh, hour as well. So just a couple of last questions that have come uh, either on the private chat or uh, while uh, they registered. Uh, one of the questions uh, that that's uh, you know in front of me right now uh, talks about the shelf life of uh, digital content or the content or uh, that is being created by the media and entertainment industry. Given that uh, you know this you know the digitalization of uh, en entertainment industry, uh, do you think that the shelf life of uh, you know uh, various uh, products that are being put out or various content that is being put out has reduced drastically? No, I, I, you know, I, I don't think it has reduced drastically. I think they have more competition because the volume of content that's being created and, you know, whether it is long form, short form, or just a picture in earlier, uh, you know, a professional photographer could take only a few pictures. Now with a digital camera, you can just keep on shooting. So the volume of output has just grown so much. So the competition for visibility and, and attention is in, you know, intensely going up. But uh, a great story is a great story. And for people who haven't watched that story, who haven't seen that video, who haven't seen that image or picture, it still remain relevant. How, the challenge is, how do you sort of uh, help your, relevant, your, your target audience or, 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 or uh, consumers to discover that, bring it to their attention, spotlight it, and make sure that uh, they get to see everything that that's relevant for them. So it's it's about more competition that every every bit of creative content is facing today. I don't think fundamentally the sh the shelf life has gone down. Right. Um, with uh, the advent of the digital content creation. Uh, what role do you see intellectual property uh, playing? Because infringement of intellectual property is definitely a major uh, issue. Now with the digital world, does it, does it mean that there is more infringement or and if there is, how do we protect uh, the IP? You know, that's a huge challenge because uh, it, it's, it's, it's a great question, Param. And uh, I wish I could give you a, a comprehensive answer to this because clearly IP is, you know, I mean, one, the IP has become a lot more lucrative because the, you know, the markets have grown exponentially from your local market. You can easily access national and from national, you can easily access regional or global markets and you can offer your content more, you know, with, with greater efficiency and, uh, and ease of delivery to a much larger audience. So that all of that has made IP a lot more valuable. Also, you know, the way you can use the IP across multiple uh, uh, layers to create value has gone up. So as a result of that, uh, uh, while the IP has become very valuable, the same uh, increasing value of the IP has uh, attracted unscrupulous elements who would, uh, who would not mind infringing on the IP, as you said, to, to create some quick value for themselves. So it's a challenge. I think we need to build awareness. We need to use technology and, uh, you know, things like blockchain, et cetera. There are, there is already talk and I'm, I'm not an expert on the subject that can go a long way in, uh, in uh, reducing some of the IP infringement, but that remains a challenge. The more something becomes valuable, the more people are likely to, you know, to try and steal it. Interesting uh, comments that have come in the chat by uh, Richard, who's joined us from Minnesota at 5 a.m. there. He says that uh, being someone who was uh, uh, at Walt Disney uh, and uh, was asked as to, aren't you afraid uh, people will copy you? And he said, uh, you know, uh, or rather Walt Disney had answered that we can create it faster than they can copy it. And that's a very interesting uh, quote. And on that note, um, I would rather uh, want to thank uh, President for 
taking time out uh, to join us for this uh, fireside chat. I'm, I'm sure uh, we and the audience would be uh, hungry for more from you and from Baroness shooting those sharp questions to you. Uh, but uh, given the paucity of time, I'm sure we would uh, we will have to uh, close the session here. I would like to once again thank you, uh, 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 President, for joining us and Baroness Parashar for uh, hosting this uh, fireside chat. Uh, just just to tell uh, our participants, uh, we have uh, an interesting fireside chat coming up as part of the monthly series on the 12th of April. Uh, with uh, Lord Grimstone, the Investment Minister of UK. Uh, we will be sending out invites and registrations for the same uh, early next week. Thank you, everyone. And thank you once again, President and Baroness Parashar for joining us. Sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very thank good you. to see you all. Thank you. Bye-bye for now. Thank you, Baroness Parashar. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everyone.